Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. Welcome back to Feminine Roadmap Podcast, the podcast that helps you navigate the challenges and the changes of midlife and empowers you to live a more vibrant second half. If you find us today on YouTube, please don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. If you're on a podcast platform, please remember to subscribe, rate, and share this podcast. Because today we are going to be talking about self-agency and making choices around our health and our lifestyle that directly impact our health. And to have that conversation with me is Dr. Amy Rothenberg. She is a licensed naturopathic doctor. She's a cancer survivor and thriver, and she's the author of You Finished Treatment, Now What? A Field Guide for Cancer Survivors. Dr. Rothenberg, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing about your story. So give me some idea about who you are and what it is that you do and why you're so passionate about this topic of cancer and cancer treatment. You bet. Um, I am a 62-year-old mother of three, and I have a wonderful partner, Paul Herskew, with whom I've been practicing since 1986. For those of you who are not familiar with naturopathic medicine, naturopathic medicine brings in the best of modern medicine with many of the age-old things that we know related to diet, exercise, the importance of the head game, and healthy living with relationship to not using too much alcohol and smoking cigarettes, and also using natural medicine products to help stimulate the body's inherent capacity for healing. We're interested in looking at the whole person physically, mentally, emotionally. We're interested in stimulating the body's own inherent healing capacity. And we're also interested in playing the role of teacher to our patients. The, The word doctor from docere is to teach. And there's a lot that we can share in terms of lifestyle and natural medicine approaches for the prevention and treatment of many acute and chronic illnesses. The topic of my book related to cancer survivorship has more to do with what, how can we best mop up from conventional cancer care? And then how can we shift our internal environment to be less hospitable to cancer? When I was 54, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and went through conventional cancer care treatment for that. A couple of months later, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I do carry a genetic mutation. I kept testing negative for it. The test, my genes didn't change, but the test got better. Uh, Unfortunately, my timing wasn't good, but I did have major surgeries, chemotherapy, radiation, immunotherapy. I take a number of drugs at this point that help to keep me healthy and safe from the return of cancer. But I amplify the effects of the conventional cancer care by making healthy choices in all of the categories that we're going to get into. And this is, I I believe for me, you know, I I just did a triathlon a couple of weeks ago. I'm in very good shape. Nobody has to worry about me. Um, But I believe that we have a lot of capacity for making good choices related to our our lifestyle that can very much and it directly impact our health. You know, we're we're all going to die at some point, but we may as well try as best as we can to have a good quality of life and, and best health outcomes. Many of the things that I write about in the book, the bulk of the book, I would say is the same kind of approaches that also help to prevent cardiovascular disease, diabetes, other cancers, cognitive decline, uh, and and a slew of other concerning uh, difficult chronic ailments that people suffer with. So we can talk about the highlights of of those recommendations whenever you like, if you want. But I do want people to just understand that I am not interested in using natural medicine to cure cancer. That's not what we're talking about. We're using natural medicine alongside conventional cancer care. We know that when people are in treatment, there's so much they can do to enhance the efficacy of treatment, to prevent side effects from the treatment, and then to address side effects that might arise. And then afterward, the focus of my book, of course, is how to mop up and sort of right the train, right the ship, Mm -hmm. get going in the best possible direction. Mm. Dr. Rothenberg, I understand that um, most cancer treatments are quite aggressive and they do, for a lot of people, cause side issues, you know, whether it's hair loss or skin issues or bone issues. I have a friend from high school who the treatment that she had to take weakened her bone and gave her osteoporosis. So we do know that it feels like 
um, you have which one is worse. You know what I mean? Like people get yeah, in this conundrum about Pick treatment. Well, and I think a lot of times when people are beginning a cancer treatment, they sign, you have to sign a lot of forms. You're basically signing your life away. Almost everything that you're going to do to help fight cancer is aggressive by design. And for good reason, it has a big, big job to do. So we know that. Um, and when you have to sign away things like this may cause other cancers, this may cause everything, 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 including death. People sign these forms, uh, these informed consent forms, because we, at, at that moment, we're more concerned about the cancer at hand, which is appropriate. That's the right thing to do. But it's also good when you're completing your care. And, and this is also true for people who are living with cancer, people with metastatic illness, many of whom can live for many, many years and have a good enough quality of life. Um, it's important to know that there are steps that you can take that can actually impact the way that you feel. And many of the side effects from conventional cancer care, from fatigue to brain fog, to lymphedema, to peripheral neuropathy, to dissatisfaction with intimacy and sex, uh, to pain, to insomnia, et cetera. These all have natural medicine approaches that can help. It may not cure them immediately, but it can help. And I, I feel badly when some of my cancer survivors say, well, you know, I'm lucky to be alive. I, I can live with this. I'm always, I say like, we're all lucky to be alive. You know what? We can do better. We can do better. And I, you know, I really, in my writing of this book, I'm very careful not to offer false hope to anybody, but also to cite the research. There's over mm. 340 or so um, references in my book. I'll just show the, the cover of my book is quite beautiful. Um, it was published by Kohler Books out of Virginia. Um, but, you know, as many references in my book, anything that I say and recommend, I am grounding and rooting in the conventional medical research. It's nothing I'm making up and it's not just my own personal experience. This is where, where we can look up, are there any approaches that can help with peripheral neuropathy that don't involve another drug? Because we know that every drug we add to the list of drugs, we get drug-drug interactions, the whole concept of polypharmacy. There are, when we start loading up drug after drug after drug, there are side effects that are not desired. You know, cognitive decline is, is number one on that list. And we know we have a, you know, an epidemic of cognitive decline. So, you know, for me, if we can find a non-drug approach, and I'm not against drugs, as I already said, I've had 18 rounds of chemo in 2014 and I, uh, immunotherapy at one point, and I take a estrogen suppressing medication at this time as something called a PARP inhibitor. I'm not against drugs. There's a time and a place for every kind of medicine, including pharmaceuticals. But sometimes I think we are a country, we're a pill popping, loving country. It's not only the fault of the people who are prescribing the drugs. I think the drug companies have a lot of advertisement and people many times will walk into my office and say, you know, I want you to prescribe me or send me to somebody who can prescribe for me X, Y, Z drug that they saw on TV or they saw an ad online. And this is why they want it. And I'm always like, well, I think we could, we probably, we should, at least should try some of the natural things first and see if we can't get some help for you without adding another drug to the regimen. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that approach because I think that we have been designed, our bodies have been designed in such a way that in a in a good healthy state we are able to make decisions that are self-healing you know and you did mention briefly the different areas early on that we need to focus on and you mentioned a state of mind and i'm really uh, fascinated with the power of how we feel and think about things and that impact on yeah. our health yes. and so i'd love to yeah. hear your the your whole, perspective the whole scientific uh, area, which is called psycho neuroimmunology. Mm -hmm. And it's like the mind affects the nervous system, the nervous system affects the immune system. And we're basically, you know, we're a hundred, everybody's a hundred percent dependent on their immune system. Obviously we talked about it more now related to COVID and other epidemic issues, but our immune system is what keeps us all from getting cancer. I mean, honestly, you know, we all have cancer cells floating around and most people who do not develop cancer have the capacity for the immune system to recognize a cancer cell and get rid of it. And for people like myself with a genetic mutation, that's a little bit harder, but we can do things. Once I know I have the mutation, now there are things I can do to help in that regard as well. It's also important to know that we are, I think we're in a crisis of, of stress 
and mm. the stress response. So your adrenal glands are these small little glands that sit above your kidneys. They do everything to help you get in that fright and flight mode when that bear is chasing you down the path in the, in the woods. Mm -hmm. But many of us are in that perpetual state of being stimulated like that. And our adrenal glands are exhausted and they are connected with the hypothalamus and pituitary axis. And this impacts everything from our metabolism to our mood, to our ability to sleep well and more. So we're, we're very interested in the role of stress. And, and for me, when I'm with a patient, I'm interested in, you know, what are the main stresses in your life? What do you do on a regular basis to help raise your threshold for feeling stress so that the same experiences, conversations, interactions, thoughts don't trigger you in the same way? The best approaches for stress management in my experience with patients and for my own personal use, number one is exercise. I mean, I, I just say, if, if, if you're not exercising, you're, you're leaving something right on the table that can help you. Uh, we think about exercise in three areas, the aerobic, something weight bearing and something stretching. And everybody should try to get all three of those in during the course of a week. If you can only do one, do the aerobic. At least with the aerobic, you're raising your threshold for feeling stress. You're dissipating the stress that you have, and you're also enabling your blood, you better perfusion, meaning your blood moves around to all the areas it needs to get. We move health by moving our blood. The better choices we make with our food, alcohol, not smoking, positive <laughs> thinking, et cetera, that makes healthier blood. And if you're exercising, then your blood is moving around better. So number one is exercise. Number two is some kind of practice where you are able to quiet your mind. Some people use mindfulness meditation. Other people have a mantra that they come up with and use, and they can change it as often as they want. Some people will do things like that combine physical with the mind, like yoga, tai chi, qigong, um, hobbies, things that enable you to kind of zone out and just get in the spit in the zone, doing whatever it is you're doing, whether it's cooking or knitting or mowing the lawn, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing, where you have the opportunity to get a break from the demands of, of our modern life. And I would say that the internet and computers, which is enabling us to do a wonderful conversation like this, uh, and cell phones have also made it so that we never are away from either getting information, needing res to, to respond to somebody, needing to buy something, need to fix something. And it's just relentless. So you have to artificially create I call them news fasts, or you create mm -hmm. computer downtime where you're the you're powering down, the computer's powering down. So that's very important as well. And then I would say the other piece that has been studied over and over again from many angles is the use of and the importance of some kind of gratitude practice where you basically either say to yourself or to a loved one each day, a couple, three things that you're thankful for, or it might take the form of, writing in a journal, or you might, in our family, we like to use the gratitude jar where we take little pieces of paper, we write down things we're thankful for, and then periodically at dinner time we'll pull one out, someone will pull one out and just read it. It's very fun. When we know now, scientifically, it's been studied that people who kind of fake it till you make it with the gratitude, it shifts their posture so that the way they walk through the world is more grateful, looking for opportunities for gratitude. And this can actually impact your health. So, you know, it, the, the head game is super important. And for cancer patients, I would say in particular, particularly for survivors, for many people who've gone through cancer care, it's so intense and so relentless. It lasts a long time. It's not that fun. Um, and many people have created situations where they get quite a bit of support, either from the healthcare team, family members, neighbors, the church group. Uh, what have you, online communities. And then when the cancer treatment ends, a lot of that support ends. And people literally are like standing in the middle of the road, like, oh my God, now what am I supposed to do? So I find that for a lot of cancer survivors, it's after treatment when things start to fall apart psycho-emotionally, because they're no longer having the cheering crowds and the, and the advocates working for them and the nurse navigators calling to make sure everything's okay. And, and people are sort of left alone. You couple that with a concept from psychology, which is called somatosensory amplification. That's basically when you feel a little something and it's really nothing, but because you've had this traumatic experience with cancer care, you're like, oh my God, I hope it's not cancer. I mean, I can tell you a funny story from my own life. I, a year or two after I was finished treatment, 
I was in the kitchen and I happened to walk into with my forehead, uh, an open cupboard door. And I got a big egg on my head and it was killing me. And I had the big ice bag of peas on my head. <laughs> and I, I went to sleep, you know, I, I was fine. I, I wasn't concussed. It was, it was more of a local thing. I went to sleep and I got up in the morning and had a really bad headache. And I literally said to my husband, oh my God, I hope I don't have brain cancer. And then, you know, we both looked at us and we started laughing. It was so absurd. It was so absurd. But any cancer survivors listening to this call are probably thinking, oh yeah, I know what she means. Feel a little gas and bloating. Oh my God, I hope I don't have ovarian cancer. Oh my God, what's this thing on my skin? I never had that before. I hope I don't have skin cancer. So learning techniques that help to bring us down to help calm anxiety, to help replace the negative thoughts. Like one of my favorite mantras, I always, I've been saying for years and years, way well before I ever had cancer is I'm breathing in peace and healing. I'm breathing out stress and worry. And I'll just say that, I'll just say that all the time. I, I learned another one recently from my grown kids, um, which is they're in their thirties. So they're using this uh, in an in athletic setting, but it really caught my fancy. They have a mantra of I'm in my prime. I'm in my prime. I'm in my prime. I love that. I love that as a person in my sixties, because, you know, it, I feel like I am in my prime and it's just a nice way to shut the switch off of the constant worrying and anxiety. Mm. And really we've been through such an unprecedented time in most of our lives where we are now adjusting our level of expectation and what life is going to look like. So I feel like we have this very unique kind of stress as well. Do you know what I mean? Like oh, life. Absolutely. COVID, it's... COVID did such a number on people. First of all, mm -hmm. what, one of the things I have a whole chapter in my book on the importance of community and connection. So, I mm -hmm. mean, one of the things that COVID did was it gave us sort of the burgeoning concept of podcasts. They've, they've been like sprouting up like mushrooms, you know, yeah. uh, which is great because getting information, important information out into the world in, in different areas of people that people have interest. But I think the lack of real in-person contact, lack of mm -hmm. physical Watch the lack of just normalcy in so many ways has been particularly challenging for people who were already feeling challenged in the psycho-emotional realm. For people who were very robust and very happy and very, I'm going to make lemonade out of lemons. No, they found ways to work with the pandemic and it, it didn't impact them as much as would be expected. Not a hundred percent true. Some of those people are also really struggling. Yeah. But I, you know, it's been wonderful the last few months, things, at least in the area where we live, things are really opening up again and whew, not a minute too soon. Yeah, I agree. You know, that emotional intelligence really comes into play, doesn't it? Yeah, you bet. In how we navigate our lives. And you talk about, we all talk about food, right? We feel like, you know, because food is definitely medicine, I believe how we eat, what we eat, when we eat. And and I think there's also this idea of knowing your own body and learning to listen to your body, isn't there? Yes, there is. I mean, when in, in my book, I have a chapter on uh, diet and nutrition. And mm -hmm. I would say that the research shows that for a cancer survivor, the best diet is an anti-inflammatory diet. So that's characterized by lean proteins, whole grains, lots of vegetables, fruit, healthy oils and nuts and seeds, and not a lot else. So not a lot of processed foods, not a lot of foods that are overly salted. If people can afford and access organic foods, they do carry more nutrition. This is something that was debated for years and the jury is in. Organic foods have a better profile for you if you can access them and afford them. Um, I would say if you can only make one big change in your diet, it would be to add more vegetables because of a few reasons, they're chock full of all kinds of um, vitamins and minerals, but they also create prebiotic materials for the probiotics in the gut. So your, your microbiome, which is everything between your clavicle and your hip bones, that's not an organ, a joint, a bone, a tendon. It's kind of the milieu, if you will, the soup that everything's floating in. Your microbiome, about 80% of your immune system arises from your microbiome. So when we can create a robust and diverse microbiome, we tend to feel better in terms of immune function. And it's all about balance. We don't want a suppressed immune system. We get sick a lot. We don't want a jacked up immune system. We have allergies. We don't want a very jacked up immune system. We have autoimmune disease. 
So focusing on the microbiome, maybe taking a probiotic, eating foods that are cultured or fermented like sauerkraut or kombucha, miso soup, kimchi. These are all ways to create a more robust and diverse microbiome. We also have microbiomes in other places in our body. So there's special little microbiomes in the nasopharynx. We have a microbiome of the vaginal area. There's microbiome in your mouth. But the main big one is that one in the abdomen and it controls not only immune function, it also controls how you balance your hormones. It controls your cognitive capacity. It controls, I said control, I mean, contributes to your, um, your mood. And so for a lot of people, when they get a better microbiome going, they feel more happy and more at peace and they sleep better. So the, the natural question is, you know, what is it that makes our microbiomes in you know, 2022 so poor? Well, antibiotics are totally overprescribed. We know that there's mm -hmm. a time and a place for them for sure, but they are overprescribed. That'll wipe out the microbiome lickety split. And then eating foods to which you are sensitive or allergic will irritate the microbiome. And then also it's true that just like the human microbiome is less robust and diverse as, as it was decades ago, the soil in which our food is grown is not as robust itself with its microbiome. So it's a whole thing, you know, like everything's mm -hmm. like a tip of the iceberg. You start talking about <laughs> one thing and it's connected to the next thing. Yeah. Um, so the anti-inflammatory diet, you know, is, is very, very different than the standard American diet, which has a lot of fast food, prepared food, hydrogenated fats, um, meats, red meats that are, are, they're not bad for you, but if, if you can get them grass fed, it's going to be better. Don't overdo them. Uh, but equally as important in terms of what you're eating is when you're eating. So we know that the fasting mimicking diet, or it's called a lot of things, intermittent fasting, or the elongated overnight fast is very healthy for all of us, regardless of your current health status. The only people that shouldn't do it are people who are pregnant or nursing, history of eating disorder. Um, some diabetics won't be able to function with a, this kind of thing. But the concept here, the sweet spot's about 13 or 14 hours overnight. Much more than that, apparently the research shows is not, you don't get more bang for the buck. So if you're somebody who is noshing at like 11 or 12 at night and having breakfast at six or seven, you have a seven hour overnight fast. I'm not gonna try to encourage you to go from seven to 13, it's too much. But I'll ask you to go from seven to eight, either knock off earlier or start later. Black coffee does not count. If you put anything in it, it counts. So black coffee doesn't count. Most people are able to get to that 13 or 14 hour range without a lot of discomfort and actually feel so good. And it helps people, it comes back to that self agency. Once you start doing one good health habit, it tends to lead to others and you get in a positive spiral with health. Health For cancer survivors, part of why this is so important is that it gives the digestive system, this is true for other illnesses as well, a chance to rest. At any given time, we can pool about 75, 80% of all of our blood in the digestive tract to help support the digestive process. So we know that if we can give the digestion a break, our body can take care of all the other things that it needs to do go out round, go after cancer cells, tidy up the immune system, help make healthy skin, give us a break in terms of uh, all that focus on digestion. So I, I love talking about what to eat. And I also love talking about when to eat. Both mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful, really. We, we are a machine in essence, aren't we? The way that That's our body right. works. And if we can fine tune it, right, we can get in there and figure out, you know, these things that work for us because i know for some people some foods are more irritating than others it might technically be considered a healthy food i think that's why i was suggesting that you know it's good for us to understand our own bodies and pay attention you know right. and i think there's a mindfulness to that too isn't there 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 sure is and i i would say that food allergies and food sensitivities are on the rise probably because of a less well-functioning microbiome in mm. general but the other thing that will aggravate food sensitivities and food allergies is the ingestion of alcohol. So in your small intestine, where the nutrients kind of move into the bloodstream, if you drink alcohol, all of those gaps kind of loosen and larger chunks of your proteins and your carbohydrates get through. And if a larger chunk is not going to be recognized as safe, if you will, and mm -hmm. your body mounts a response to that. 
react to that. You may have heard of the expression or the diagnosis of a leaky gut syndrome. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the part of the definition of a leaky gut syndrome. So healing the gut, working on the microbiome, that it's such a, and, and just really appreciating the very strong gut brain connection in terms of both cognition and mood um, is, is, is a part of medicine that uh, I think is making its way into conventional medical understanding. It's not quite there yet. A lot of MDs might kind of roll their eyes about this, but I, mm-hmm. I do think that the research is on our side in terms of helping us understand why this is so much the case and mm-hmm. why, why this is an important area for further research, for sure. Mm. That is the most fascinating thing, Dr. Rothenberg, to me, one of the most fascinating things, neuroplasticity and this idea that your gut is your second brain yeah. and really thinking about thinking thinking about eating, but they're, they're, they're like this, you know, the thinking and the eating, they go together. It's such a, an incredibly, um, it's just such a beautiful symbiotic thing that our body does. And I think we could get excited about, at least for me, this experiment with how could I feel my best? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I would say, you know, it's what you eat, and when you eat, and then also put in a, a word around how you eat. Many mm. of my patients share with me that they eat standing over the kitchen sink. And in fact, that there's an expression for it that I never heard of. It's called dots, dinner over the sink. And in fact, oh. I wrote an article on Medium a cu- couple of years back called a moratorium on dots. Because <laughs> I mean, this is people, the concepts are like, I asked people, when's the last time you sat down at a table, not a desk, uh, you know, and <laughs> with a napkin, and a plate, maybe with another person, you know, uh, lit a candle and, and just ate your dinner that way. It's also important how we eat, with whom we're eating, what the state of mind is at the moment that we're eating. I love personally to take a good few cleansing breaths, maybe say a little blessing or prayer intention around the food and to welcome any guests that I have and to really mark that time. This is where we are sitting down to nourish ourselves. And by being calm and focused on that, as opposed to like eating while we're also like on the computer and got the phone here, I think it, it's it's good to once in a while, at least give ourselves that one of life's greatest pleasures. Mm. You use the word nourishment and nourishment really does come on so many levels. We can nourish our soul. We can nourish our bodies. We can nourish our minds. And, and you know, as you're expressing this kind of hurried, harried lifestyle, I have to wonder when we're in that state, there's something probably not functioning at its best in our gut at that moment, because we're releasing hormones and and things in our bodies, right? When we stay in that elevated state instead of sitting and eating, am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the immune system is a beautiful, uh, integrated and very complicated system that we're, we're really just, we know a lot about it, but we're every year we're learning more and more. And all fingers point to the idea of how stress has a negative impact on immune function. That's sort of the, the take home uh, concept there. But, you know, I think for cancer survivors, you know, giving people the opportunity to consider natural medicine approaches for symptoms that persisted after care is very important and to present patients with the evidence-based approaches that show efficacy Mm -hmm. uh, is is very important. And to understand when, for me, when I'm sitting with a patient is really to understand what is it that's most limiting to this patient at this moment in time. And let's see if if we can't address whatever that thing might be. Because uh, honestly, that is the ultimate definition of stress on the body when the body needs to fight cancer and then you go through all of that treatment it it, it kind of there's a there's a journey to fight the cancer and then there's a journey to recover from that fight it seems like absolutely i agree entirely so that is something that your book helps people with it's that journey back am i right it is it is and i you know, one of the chapters in the book is called um, How to Talk So Your Oncologist Listens and Listen So Your Oncologist Talks, which is borrowed from a wonderful parenting book called How to Talk So Your Kids Listen and Listen So Your Kids Talk <laughs> by Farber and Maslish, one of my parenting Bibles. But 
you know, I really emphasize in there because a lot of cancer patients feel disempowered. Mm. They, they feel overwhelmed by the diagnosis, overwhelmed by the schedule, overwhelmed by not feeling well, overwhelmed by fearing uh, their mortality. And so I really, I lay out, it's kind of bullet points, you know, things that people can do to gain back some of that self-power and also self-understanding and how to arrive at a visit with a doctor and what kind of questions you might consider asking. And uh, I go pretty broad on that. If nobody's going to relate to every single one of those bullet points, but um, I think it's important to remember that you, the, the patient is in the driver's seat. It's, it's not the doctor and being able you know, bringing somebody with you, writing down your questions ahead of time, telling the doctor that you have questions you want to ask at the, at the outset, many visits are very, very short. Um, you know, ask to please save time for my questions and to be sure you understand their answers, um, you know, and, and to advocate for getting information in ways that work for you, whether it's in writing or maybe you can audio tape the interview. Um, not all doctors will want that, but, you know, just trying to advocate in that way. Mm -hmm. I always like to meet my doctors, myself being fully dressed. I don't want to meet a doctor while I'm in a Johnny and it puts us at a just a weird power dynamic right off the bat. I want them to see me first as a person, then as a patient. Mm -hmm. um, little little things like that. I always say, you know, bring your own snacks. His, you know, I, I used to laugh that I have wonderful, wonderful care at a, a big teaching hospital in Boston and they had free snacks, you know, all kinds of free snacks loaded with refined carbohydrates, hydrogenated <laughs> fats and sugar. And I said, so like, oh my God, eat that. And you're going to be a return customer here in a few years, you know? Yeah. Um, can we get, can we get some fruit? Can we get some unsalted nuts? Can we, you know, the, things exist. So things like that, always bring your own water bottle, learn where the bathrooms are. Um, and that a lot of doctor's offices now, particularly in the oncology world, you can check in and that you can give them your phone number and they'll text you when the doctor's ready. Because many times the doctors are running 15, 30, 45, 50 minutes late. And so instead of getting aggravated and fuming and getting that whole psychoneuroimmunology irritation going, I personally, I give them my, where I go, I give them my phone number. They text me when I'm ready. And I've, I've logged in as much as 8,000 steps, walking the, walking the corridors or going out at the healing garden they have in, in near the hospital. You know, I'm not going to let myself get upset about something that I can't control. That's actually a really good point, isn't it? Um, learning to navigate that emotional state, like what can I control? What can I not control? And shifting our energy to that space. So that we do, I mean, it's really stress. What you're talking about overall is really stress. It's not just emotional stress. It's physical stress. It's gut stress. It's it's recognizing in what ways we can minimize that response in our body on all the systems is what I'm hearing you say. Uh, yes. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Now, when you talk about reducing the risk of recurrence, for example, yeah. What are some things that you find, Dr. Rothenberg, that are helpful for people? Yeah. Number one thing is stop smoking. Mm. Uh, a lot of cancer patients that feel, well, I already got cancer, so what's the big deal? But we know that recovery and the chance of positive, the best outcomes, whenever you stop smoking is going to be worthwhile. American Cancer Society has many uh, free smoking cessation programs online, American Lung mm -hmm. Association as well. So that's number one. Number two, I would say, is to move more and not be sedentary. Every study they've done on cancer survivorship, those who exercise have better outcomes. Um, I had 18 rounds of chemo in 2014. In my last chemo, I said to my husband, okay, honey, in six months, I want to do our first triathlon together. And he said, that sounds great. I'll be on your photography team. <laughs> so I did my first triathlon six months after, six months and a couple of days after my last chemo. And I've done one or two a year since then during COVID. We mapped them out around our, our town because we, there were no organized sanctioned ones. I just did one a few weeks ago. So, you know, bump up. If you already have a healthy relationship to exercise, maybe consider bumping it up. And if you're a sedentary person, we're going to start super slow. We're going to do some consciousness raising first. How many steps do you actually take a day? We'll have people use their phones or get a cheap uh, pedometer somewhere. You can get them for 10 bucks. Um, if you're only taking 700 steps a day, okay, that's okay. That's where we're going to start. We're going to see if we can get you up to 2,000 steps a day. 
And I'm going to give you a suggestion for an online yoga class you might consider for people who've never done yoga, chair yoga for old people, you know, something like that. <laughs> and we're going to start slow. And what I find with people is when they start slow and they commit to it, that they feel a little better and then they can do more. Yeah. Okay. So stop smoking, move more, shift over as best you can to an anti-inflammatory diet. That's very important. Address your stress in your life, as we've already described. Use some natural medicine products that have been shown to have a high antioxidant content. So things like um, curcumin derived from turmeric, fish oil, berberine, vitamin D. There are several things like that that can be used that the research shows good effect and they won't break the bank. Um, that's something that would be individualized to the patient. One of the key features of naturopathic medicine is that we're treating individual patients, not diagnoses. So not every person would get the same plan. It depends on your own genetic inheritance, your biochemical makeup, the choices and decisions you've made throughout your life, things that have happened to you. Everybody's an individual going through this life. I mean, hopefully <laughs> we're connected with others, but we are individual and the treatment plans should be individualized to the patient. Um, the other thing that's important to remember is to not over drink. Almost every type of cancer survivorship is going to do worse in people that drink too much alcohol. What is a safe amount of alcohol to drink if you're a cancer survivor? The answer is probably zero. Um, does that mean you should never have a glass of wine with dinner? No. If you never have a cold beer on a hot summer day? No, you should enjoy your life. But in terms of if, if you have an alcohol problem, if you drink too much, that's not going to be good for any kind of cancer that you've had for a lot of different reasons. It's high in sugar. It's not good in terms of the leaky gut and inflammation. So, and, and other reasons, um, the, the safe amount, if you read in, in the American cancer Society, would be for men, two drinks a day for women, one drink a day, but I, the, I am not recommending that, but that would certainly be the outer limit of alcohol ingestion. Right. The other area that's very ripe for action for many people has to do with our toxic exposures. So there are many things that we can't control, the air, the water. I mean, we certainly can work on environmental efforts. And, and if you have the time and the bandwidth, or maybe you're in the, the pray and pay, pay and pray method of trying to help make it a better world, that's good too. We need that too. Um, that some of the toxins, we, we know there's thousands and thousands of chemicals. Many of them are bioactive. We know some of them cause cancer, asbestos, you know, is the big one up there, smoke inhalation. But we, there are other things that are chemicals that we don't exactly know how they interact with the human condition, the human body. So we take the precautionary principle. We try to reduce the amount of chemical exposures in our own lives. So that's where the organic food comes in. Also the products that you use in cleaning your home, your personal care products, shampoo, makeup, try to read the labels, try to find the things that have the least amount of chemicals and lean into the concept that you are perfectly in, in whatever you believe in God, nature, evolution, whatever, we are perfectly created to detoxify from the natural metabolites of the digestive process. So if you take all the external toxins away and you just talk about the digestive process, we are good at that, theoretically. We, we have the potential to be good at that. So there's a whole world of this part of the human physiology called the emunctory systems. Your emunctories are those that help to, they come in four major categories. The first set of emunctories has to do with ensuring a good bowel movement each day. Some people do every other day, probably longer than that, not too good. Uh, urinating adequately and staying hydrated perspiring at least a few times a week, getting a good sweat. So refer back to the exercise. Um, and the fourth one is breathing, deep breathing. And deep breathing, of course, is a wonderful way to help us come centered, to relax, help with stress, et cetera. So we have having a good balance between urinating, sweating, and breathing. I would add a fifth thing to the monkeries, which is sidestepping, letting go of, I don't know other words you want to use there, uh, the people and the organizations and activities in your life that cause you undue stress. Mm -hmm. Some people use cancer and cancer diagnosis as a wake up call. I do not like that person. I'm not going to be with my job. I hate my job. I have to make a change. This is a house I never wanted to live in. You know, big time changes. Of course, a lot of times if you're in treatment, that's too much, but people can use a, a big diagnosis of any sort uh, as a wake up call. So supporting the emunctories while at the same time reducing the toxic exposure load 
is very important. You can also change your internal environment by ensuring adequate sleep every night. We're in an epidemic of insomnia. Um, many, mm -hmm. many, 40% of Americans are getting less than, adults are getting less than six hours of sleep a night, not enough. Uh, we really want to be in that seven to eight hour range. Many people are using all kinds of devices to chart their sleep. I'm not sure it's helping, to be honest, um, but it is always interesting. Information is interesting. There are many natural medicine approaches to help with insomnia that don't require taking a benzodiazepine or other kind of sleep aid. Most sleep aids on the market really were designed and studied to be used in the short term. You know, after a traumatic event, after surgery, after a very bad loss, they're never meant to be used years on end. And people get addicted to things like Ambien and Trazodone. And I have a lot of people in my practice, very health conscious, don't think anything about taking Ambien. These drugs all have as one of their major long-term side effects, cognitive decline. So mm -hmm. I'm always working with patients on the concept of, you know, let's take a look at your drug list. Are there any that we can, let's call your doctor. Let's see that any that maybe we can, while we're working up some natural medicine protocols, can we help to you to reduce the amount, you know, all side effects are dose dependent. So sometimes you have to be on a medicine for whatever reason, if you can take less of it, you're going to have less side effects. So that's important to remember. And then there are certain drugs that people can get off of. What I can say is that prescribing in the medical school model is something that's emphasized and all through one's residency and through meeting with drug reps, et cetera. What's not emphasized is de-prescribing. So what we need more of is learning how to de-prescribe medications gradually and mindfully so that a person doesn't have big rebound effects or big side effects or feel much, much worse. So this goes with many, many different kinds of medications, not all. Some medications right. are life saving and people need to stay on and they'll be on in the rest of their life and they're life saving. And I, I you know, for me, it, it's the sheer number of drugs that a lot of people come in on. And I just think like, we don't really know, have any idea what's happening inside that person's body with the drug, drug interactions. They're not tested on people, seven, eight, nine drugs at one time. And, you know, typical for me would be somebody who's on something for GERD you know, like a PPI or something, proton pump inhibitor, something for hypertension, something for high cholesterol. They take something for pain here. Thyroid. And there. They might be taking thyroid. Although I would say thyroid replacement is the one thing that's for most people very opaque. They take it, they, they need it and it's fine. Uh, not everybody. Uh, but then a lot of people are also on some kind of antidepressant, anti-anxiety, and maybe they're also on some medicine because they have ADD. So they're, they're 10, 10 drugs. I don't even have to keep it straight. Uh, they got the pill boxes, I guess. I use pill boxes myself because I do take, as I said, a number of medications and I do take a small handful of nutritional supplements, botanical medicines in pill form. So I understand the idea of taking things on a regular basis. But I think that that's th those are the main areas, sleep, detox, anti-inflammatory diet, moving more, addressing one's stress. Um, and then the role of community and connection, I think is very important. We know that people that feel like they have somebody that they can talk to, when they're not feeling well, that they feel supported by somebody in some way, that that is also going to lead to better outcomes for people. Um, for me, you know, the, oh, one thing I would also say is hands-on um, approaches, whether it is massage or cranial sacral therapy or an osteopathic physician who works in the cranial field, this can be very, very soothing and helpful for people and helps to shift that internal environment. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also lean into some of the whole body, whole person medicines that are whole person medicines unto themselves. So things like constitutional homeopathy, whole person acupuncture, Ayurvedic medicine. I have a particular interest in, ho interest in homeopathy. The other two approaches I will refer to people in my area. Sometimes when every person's doing everything right, but they still don't feel good, they need some more, something more on the energetic level. And these other sorts of approaches can have a positive impact on that energetic level. Now, we are at the end of our time and you've already given us so many takeaways. So why don't you tell people how they can get a hold of you and get in contact with you, Dr. Oh, Brooke. thank you so much for that opportunity. Uh, yes, you can find <clears throat> me uh, you, at my author website is www.dramyrothenberg.com. It's D R A M Y. R O T H E N B E R G www.dramyrothenberg.com. And um, 
My office is Naturopathic Healthcare in Northampton, Massachusetts. You can find me there. Um, and you can find me on Instagram and on Twitter. You can just look up my name and you'll, you'll see me there. I'd love you to come follow me. Love you to get my book. The book is available um, everywhere books are sold. So if you have an independent bookstore in your town, they can get that book for you in a couple of days. It's also available as an ebook. And I read the book for Audible. So you can find it on Audible as well. And uh, send feedback because this, there, there will be another edition to this book. And I love to hear from people. I love to hear from readers and grateful readers. Uh, put a positive review up on Amazon if you have a sec. And, uh, and spread the word because people, I think, can make a big impact on both quality of life and health outcomes. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Rothenberg, I want to thank you so much for being here today, for sharing your absolute wealth of information and passion and just having such concrete information is actually stress relieving. I think the way, you know, to have a resource like you in the world that is so able to communicate clearly these things in such a way that we can receive them and change our lives. And I'm so grateful for the work that you do and how you show up in the world to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It has totally been my pleasure. Okay. Friends, today I've been speaking with Dr. Amy Rothenberg. She's a licensed naturopathic doctor. She's a cancer survivor and thriver and an author of the book, You Finished Treatment, Now What? A Field Guide for Cancer Survivors. If you find us here on YouTube, just check down below. I will have the links to her there. Friends, this conversation is literally life-changing. We can think about ourselves in a way that is pro-health, proactive. We have things we can do. We have things we can think. We have things we can eat. We have things we can remove. And we can live a healthy life on all the levels. And don't be discouraged if you feel like you're miles away from where you want to be. Take the time to make small changes every day. Take good care of yourself. Surround yourself with loving, supporting, supportive people. Give yourself time to think and rest. Sleep well. Drink that water. Lots and lots of healthy food. Think of yourself as a precious gift that you are protecting. Think of it like that teacup you put on the shelf, right? You don't want anybody to break it. You wanna take care of it. You are that precious teacup. Take care of yourself. Take care of that preciousness that you have. Give the world your very best. Give yourself the very best. This is a conversation that is a daily decision. This is something we do have control over, my friends. And if you have had cancer or you know someone that's going through cancer, please reach out for this resource from Dr. Rothenberg and give yourself the tools that you need to get your body, your mind, and your life back on track. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so grateful that you took the time to listen. And friends, please remember to subscribe, rate, share. This conversation that we've had today could literally save a life. So don't forget to share it. We look forward to sharing more inspirational people, conversations, tips, and strategies in the weeks to come. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye.